No Small Endeavor is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Ever wondered how artificial intelligence or 3D printing is used to solve medical problems? Or how medical research is discovering new ways to slow or stop medical conditions we used to think of as untreatable? Listen to Tomorrow's Cure, where host Kathy Werzer interviews experts from Mayo Clinic and other renowned organizations, such as Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins Hospital, or the Veteran Health Administration. Get a glimpse into these brilliant minds as they share how they use innovative thinking in their pursuit of answers for patients. What they describe may sound futuristic, but listen and you will find out Tomorrow's Cure is already here. Find Tomorrow's Cure wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lee C. Camp, and this is No Small Endeavor, exploring what it means to live a good life. When I was 13, I went to the psych ward for the first time. That's Emmy Neatfeld, an Ivy League-trained software engineer and author of the memoir entitled Acceptance. Today, we discuss Emmy's story from the psych ward to foster care to homelessness to Harvard and how that presumed rags to riches story is quite complicated. I was learning, you know, I had to portray myself as this perfect overcomer. We really do expect people to be perfect in a way that I knew I was not. And I just didn't realize yet that nobody is perfect in that way. And those perfect human interest stories are fictions. All coming right up. I'm Lee C. Camp. This is No Small Endeavor, exploring what it means to live a good life. One of the things I've deeply loved about a career in academia is that at its best, it honors nuance. It expects nuance, actually, that moralisms and trite bits of conventional wisdom and even widely accepted advice for living life well may, in fact, do a great deal of harm if they're not rightly considered, critiqued, or challenged. Nuance is your friend, I tell my students over and over again. Today's interview with Emmy Neatfeld exhibits this necessity of nuance. When I was 13, I went to the psych ward for the first time. And from the psych ward, she wandered through a locked institutional facility to foster care to times of homelessness. And then she got into Harvard and then went on to get a great job at Google. This is the classic American rags to riches story, is it not? poverty to riches, lowly misery to upwardly mobile happiness, the classic Americum summum bonum. But today, a pursuit of nuance and how such a story may not be quite what it appears. Emmy Neatfeld, a former software engineer, is an author writing about mental health, inequality, and education for the Atlantic, Teen Vogue, Slate, and elsewhere. She lives in New York City with her family, and today we're discussing her book entitled Acceptance, a memoir of her journey from foster care and homelessness to Harvard and big tech. Amy, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a delight to have you with us today. As I told you before we started the interview, I I felt really moved by your book and moved by how you had the courage to share all the things you share and tell all the things you tell. The deeply moving way I thought the book closed, but I just thank you and honor you and appreciate your courage and all of that. I thought what I'd like to do is start kind of with part one, having some time to talk about your childhood and adolescence. And I think one of the early stories that really caught my attention was your first going to therapy as a fourth grader. And as you kind of share that story, what would be thought of on the outside, I suppose, as an act of help for someone seemed to be instead more a manipulation. You were being used as a pawn, I suppose. But how would you describe that and and the significance of that early moment in your childhood? 
I grew up for the first nine years of my life in a two-parent, middle-class family in Minnesota. And things were definitely not idyllic. My parents had a very tumultuous marriage, which was occasionally violent. But, you know, I was kind of content, able to focus on my goals, which you know, at the time included becoming a Christian comedian, attending (laughs) Moody Bible Institute. I was very religious and found a lot of meaning and comfort in that. I think you were a a Bible memorization champion as well. I I was. I was the state champion of Minnesota (laughs) um, in fourth grade. I memorized thousands of verses. And then one day when I was in fourth grade, my mom came and picked me up from school and bribed me not to tell my father where we were going. She drove me on this rainy afternoon to a place called the Christian Recovery Center, which was a ominous-sounding therapy clinic. Then I went to what was called play therapy. But I was immediately skeptical. I was like, why am I coming here? You know, I wasn't having emotional problems. I was doing just fine. But my parents' marriage had been on the rocks, was getting worse. And I almost immediately sensed that my mom was there to try to dig up evidence that my father had abused me. You know, my father could be very strict. There was corporal punishment, but there was nothing that I could confess. I didn't have anything. And yet it quickly became clear that this treatment that is supposedly in kids' best interest and, you know, who wouldn't bring their child to therapy, right? It always seems like such a good thing to do. But that it was a way to manipulate me or to try to get me to say things that were going to change my life in ways that I really did not want my life to change. Soon thereafter, if I remember the timeline, your father... I think as you put it in the book, he he announced to you that he's changing his name to Michelle and then leaves the family. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And so in hindsight, my mom didn't need a big confession because my father came out as a trans woman and announced that she was going to change her name and transition. And, you know, if you're an evangelical Christian who wants to get a divorce, there's really no better reason than, you know, that you don't want to be in a lesbian marriage. So my parents quickly, quickly separated after that. And then when do you first recollect the sense that things are deeply disturbed or your mother's dealing with her own sorts of issues, mental illness? A few months after my parents split up, it started to become clear that despite their problems in their relationship, that they really had kind of stabilized each other. Where my mom had been shopping a lot in secret during her lunch hour. And she would buy things like 100 Winnie the Pooh wristwatches at a dollar each and hide them in her office at work. But once my dad was no longer living with her, it was like all of those things that were secret were suddenly out in the open. And there was really no checks or balances for either of my parents' behavior. And so within a couple of months, my mom had accumulated tons and tons of stuff in the apartment where she was living, a pattern that was only going to get worse over the years that followed. Coming out of that early experience with therapy, what are some of the consequences for you as far as medicine, ways you began to think of yourself, or what what are some of your earliest memories of significant changes that occur out of that time for you? When I went to therapy for the first time, it was really when I stopped trusting adults. I had always been a goody two-shoes, teacher's pet. I grew up basically as an only child, even though I have a half-brother. And so I just always wanted to make adults happy. And I basically believed that if I was good, they would be proud of me and I would get what I wanted. And suddenly it seemed to me like, I was navigating this world in which I really could not trust the people who were claiming that they were trying to help me. And this manifests during the custody evaluation where my parents fought over custody for 
a little more than a year, and it was a very brutal battle over who would get me. And eventually my mom won, and my other parent, Michelle, moved across the country, and I have never seen her since. And my mom also kept bringing me to therapy. I remember after she had custody, I was at the beginning of sixth grade, and in my medical records from that first session with a family therapist, it says that my mother is looking for evidence to shore up her custody decision. So she brought me there, you know, trying to get me to to say things about my father so that she would continue to have full custody. It's hard because it seems like something any reasonable parent would do, right? If you believe your child has been hurt, and I think my mom definitely believed that, you want to get help for them. And a divorce is stressful for any child. And I think many people would be like, you know, okay, therapy is great. But unfortunately, the type of therapy that I was receiving was not what felt like in my best interest or focused on what I was feeling or what I needed. Instead, my mom told the therapist, I think Emmy has ADHD. She said that I was disorganized, chronically late. Like, what 11-year-old is not disorganized and chronically late? But I was quickly, I was given a very short assessment and I was sent to receive medication. And once I was at the doctor, I got ADD medication. And when that made me feel worse, I got another ADD medication. And then I got Xanax to deal with the panic attacks that stimulants gave me. And then they said, okay, well, if you're not responding to ADD medication, it must mean you're depressed. And so then I took all these different antidepressants And eventually, within two years, ended up on antipsychotics. And by then, I was really convinced that I was the problem or that there was something deeply wrong with me, at least biochemically, that only medication could solve. When, in fact, in hindsight, it seems like I was really dealing with a lot of side effects, with withdrawal. People were not really talking about how hard it can be to come off these drugs back then. And instead, I was just pulled off one after another after another until I was in a really dark place. I was doing things to cope that were not healthy for me. I was harming myself. I was not eating. I wanted to die. And in part, it was because it seemed like those were the only options available to me to cope. And also, it was kind of what everybody expected of me. Mm. Yeah, you said at one point, no one would listen to me, no one would trust me, no one came. I can't imagine kind of the, the sense of desperately wanting someone to kind of see into your life and what's really going on and not having anyone who will, who will see, who will really pay attention or witness what's going on. Unpack some of that for us, if you will. From the first family therapy appointment after my mom won custody, I was begging the psychologist come to my mom's house, come see how we're living. Because, you know, her shopping had gotten really bad. There were waist high piles of stuff everywhere with mice running through them. We had mildew. There was the stench throughout everything. And it would get so bad that we didn't have hot water for several weeks. We didn't have a place to shower. And I was like, you have to come see our house. And then you'll understand why I feel bad when I feel bad. And yet, you know, he was not going to come. Like therapists don't usually make house calls. And over the years that followed, as I was given all of these different medications, I continued to, to try to tell the adults like, hey, here's what's happening, right? My mom has a problem. But it really felt like nobody was listening to me or nobody believed me. And in hindsight, when I was writing acceptance and I requested all of these thousands of pages of medical records, I discovered that people had heard what I was saying and that my mom had some issues, but there was really very little that they felt that they could do, short of call Child Protective Services and risk me ending up in foster care. And so instead, it just felt like I was screaming into the void. And 
that nothing that I was going to say could matter. Yeah. This begins to somewhat quickly devolve into everything getting ramped up, right? You end up psych ward, institutional rehab programs of various sorts, and then in time, a boarding school that's mixed with times of homelessness. Could you kind of point to some of the so people can kind of get a, a glimpse of kind of how this unfolds, you know, what, what are kind of key things you would point to in the, the way all of this devolves? When I was 13, I went to the psych ward for the first time. And I loved the psych ward. It was so much nicer than being at home. They had endless hot water for showers. The air was clean. I felt like I could hear myself think in a way that I absolutely could not at my mom's house. And so after I was feeling a little better and I was discharged, I just immediately wanted to come back. And I wound up kind of going in and out of the hospital several times over that year before I was finally 14 and got sent to a locked residential treatment facility. And that was one of those places that has bars over the windows, three sets of locked doors, a padded isolation room for when kids act out. And it was a very punitive place. We were expected to really take full responsibility for our lives, you know, as teenagers who were mostly coming from these really difficult situations. And my education was also really hindered because we did not go to regular school. Instead, we had a classroom on site that was staffed by special education department teachers who guided us through multiplication worksheets and had us read aloud from books. And as somebody who had all of these academic ambitions, that was like torture for me because I had always found solace in reading, in studying, in imagining being able to leave my family and go to this magical place where there would be filled with people like me, you know, spending time at the library. And so while I was there, I feel very fortunate that I was able to get my hands on a library ACT prep book. I could start studying for the standardized test and teaching myself all of the stuff that I was missing in school. And that gave me agency. It gave me shaped my days. And it helped me imagine like, okay, maybe when I get out of this place, I can go away to college. And that was really what got me through when I was at the end of a year, I was discharged into foster care. I went to go live with a family in the way out in the suburbs, like in the middle of a cornfield. And they believed that my ambition caused my misery and really, you know, tried to discourage me from studying so much. But it was also a period of relative stability for me that helped me eventually get a scholarship to camp, an arts camp, and then a scholarship to boarding school, where I spent my junior and senior year really focused on, okay, how could I get into college? How can I get into the type of college that will give me a full ride, which meant an Ivy League university, and the type of place that will just completely change my life so that I don't have to rely on my mom, so that I don't have to rely on my social worker, and so that I can have this kind of future that I've been dreaming about since I was in this locked facility. You're listening to No Small Endeavor and a conversation with Emmy Neatfeld. I love hearing from you. Tell us what you're reading, who you're paying attention to, or send us feedback about today's episode. You can reach me at lee at nosmallendeavor.com. You can get show notes for this episode in your podcast app or wherever you listen. These notes include links to resources mentioned in the episode, as well as a PDF of my complete interview notes and a full transcript. We'd be delighted if you tell your friends about No Small Endeavor and invite them to join us on the podcast because that helps extend the reach of the beauty, truth, and goodness we are seeking to sow in the world. 
Coming up, what Emmy calls the false gospel of acceptance and what it might actually take to heal from one's past and move towards a flourishing life. As we've already noted, the book's title, Acceptance, you kind of depict the way you're hearing from therapists and social workers and so forth talk about acceptance. It's almost, it's almost like it's a blunt instrument kind of used against you. And you say, quote, shrinks preach the doctrine of radical acceptance, which did not seem like the best fit for my situation. Or they say, focus on what you can control, the shrinks preached, but who could be controlled seemed more relevant. Or then again, you say, the dogma, only you are responsible for your emotions. It seems like you're getting emotionally bludgeoned, so I suppose, with the notion of radical acceptance. Almost all of the therapy that I received taught that acceptance was the key to solving any emotional problem. So you are in a bad situation. You are feeling bad because of it. What is the solution? The solution is just to accept. Like, accept that you're in the situation. Accept that you're not getting out of it. And then you can find some emotional freedom. And I really hated this idea. It seemed very untrue to me because I was in a bad situation at home with the psychiatric drugs, with the treatment, with school. And sometimes when you're in a bad situation, you know, I just need to change the situation, right? The situation is the problem, not me. But I was told this again and again and again that like my refusal to accept was almost like a moral failure and was the reason that I was depressed when I was in foster care living with strangers who thought that my art history homework of Michelangelo's David was pornography, <laughs> right? My problem is that I am not accepting being in foster care and being adequately mindful every day that I'm spending in this family where I don't belong. And that was how I named the book Acceptance was almost in defiance of this idea. Because after a while, I was so sick of it. I was like, I am not going to accept these circumstances. I want to fight against them with everything I have in me so that one day my life can look different than it does. And I don't think those two ideas are necessarily in opposition, but definitely it was framed as though they were. And at a time when I needed support and help to how are we going to change my life? How are we going to make my life bearable? Because I was going through things that would make anybody super depressed and down. And instead I received this false gospel of acceptance. Yeah. The time begins to come in which you need to begin to make the pitch to various schools to become a student. And I think it's just fascinating that here you are as a child and, and there's all this sort of push against the stories that you'll tell and whether it's in foster care or whether it's in therapy where you get called out for so-called manipulating because you're trying to get your needs met. And yet then you began to see that there seems to be almost like a required manipulation or some sort of way of telling your story in a way that's going to get you where you want to go that requires you to kind of play a game. But would you unpack kind of what you feel like that game was or what you had to do in that process? When I was in therapy and then residential treatment and then foster care, really anything that I did that made life harder for adults was labeled manipulation. Like there was one time when I was going to go visit my brother and I asked two different staff members at the facility, hey, did I get this pass? Am I going to be able to see him? And asking somebody twice was considered manipulation. If one person didn't know the answer and you asked somebody else, you would be punished, as I was. And I wasn't allowed to go see him. I had to spend the whole weekend indoors. And that teaches you something. It teaches you that you should not advocate for yourself and that doing so is bad and makes you a bad person. Just a few years later, I was applying for college and it was the summer break at boarding school and my mom's house was worse than ever. 
but my foster care file had been closed when I went to school. And so I found myself bouncing from friend sofa to friend sofa before finally running out of places to stay just after having a surgery and being on all these painkillers with my legs taped in bandages, sleeping in the back seat of my car as I tried to write these college essays. And what I was learning in this college application process is that what people called manipulation was really survival. That you had to portray yourself in a certain way to have any chance at getting into an elite university. I could not simply tell people the truth. You know, look at me, I haven't showered in a week, I smell bad, my greasy hair is matted to my scalp. You should accept me to Harvard. That was not a sales pitch that was gonna work. And so instead I was learning, you know, I had to portray myself as this perfect overcomer who had been made stronger by all that I had faced. I really had not overcome anything because I was still in the middle of it. But I had to tell the story and I had to find a way that despite still being in this situation of precarity and being always in situations where somebody could easily choose to hurt me, I had to make it sound like I had already won. And that that was really what colleges required and in many ways what America requires from people who are disadvantaged. I felt like an enormous liar because at that point, my senior year of high school, I was relapsing into eating disorder behaviors. I had lost a lot of weight. I was abusing Adderall. You know, I was not in a good, healthy place, which, you know, I had learned to think about as being in itself a moral failure. And yet I was putting on this song and dance of saying, look, like I'm a survivor, right? I'm so wonderful. You should accept me. And I think it would be years to really recognize that as adults, you know, we have a private life and we have a public life and those things do not always match up and that's okay. But I think especially around the framing of college admissions and the way we think about people lifting themselves up out of poverty and precarity, we really do expect people to be perfect in a way that I knew I was not. And I just didn't realize yet that nobody is perfect in that way. And those perfect human interest stories are fictions. There's just one passage. You're talking about a guidance counselor who didn't know about your family situation, and she would get frustrated with you about talking so much about college and this sort of dream that you had about college. And then you said, quote, she didn't understand how college was a metonym for safety, security, and for my entire future. And when I read that, I thought that that seemed like a very helpful way for adults to think about listening to teenagers and children. And that is that they're often maybe talking in metonyms, that they're, they'll they point to one thing, but it's not that thing necessarily. It's something underneath that thing that they're really trying to get at that they might not have words for. And that if we would just simply try to develop this skill of saying, of listening, we might say metonomically as opposed to literally to children. But I don't know, how does that strike you? I'm so glad you called out that passage. And when I look back, and I wonder what could have been different. The one thing that I really wish could have been different was having adults be on my side when I had these certain goals. You know, I was very fixated on college and I was willing to do literally anything in the world to achieve that dream. And that list of things I was willing to do included being kinder to myself, eating lunch, not hurting myself, Whereas the goals that were kind of imposed on me from adults, like deal with your trauma, stop hurting yourself for the sake of not hurting yourself, I frankly wasn't willing to do anything to, to achieve those goals because they weren't my goals. Now that I'm older and I'm preparing to become a parent and I have nieces and nephews and mentees, 
I recognize how terrifying it is to see a young person harming themselves or doing things that really seem to be jeopardizing their future and going against their self-interest. And I also think that the most powerful tool of change is that internal motivation and being willing to, to engage with me on it. And, you know, a lot of people were like, it's great that you have this goal, but it's totally unrealistic. And that was not really helpful for me to hear because I think at the end of the day, yes, it was really a long shot to get into one of these schools. And along the way, I was going to make so many changes that would ultimately help me no matter what the outcome was. So you get your acceptance letter and you get into Harvard. And then you say, the shame of my past would be erased because I meant something. But not surprisingly to the reader, but perhaps surprisingly to the 18-year-old Emmy, this moment does not yield happily ever after. So un unpack some of that for us. Yeah. When I got that acceptance letter, it felt like my life split in half. I was sitting at a public library. I saw the word congratulations, and I just started screaming. <laughs> Annoying, like 200 library patrons, a bunch of librarians. I ran out into the rain. I was dancing. I was <laughs> screaming more. And I was just like, you know, I proved everybody wrong. Like I was filled with yeah. this like satisfaction of all the people who, for whom I could just rub it in their face, you know? And then reality came in where, yes, my future was going to be very, very different. And I was still a teenage girl on my own without a family. I was staying by myself in a hostel during spring break from boarding school. And I was super, super lonely. And it was really after getting that big success that, that I started to realize, oh my gosh, this might not actually just erase all of my problems in the way that I hoped it would. And from there, I would have a big reckoning of how is this actually changing my life versus how am I still vulnerable? What am I still dealing with at home and in my relationships? And, you know, maybe to other people, it would have been obvious, like, yeah, this is not going to make all your problems go away. But I really had been counting on that. And so then you have to go through that whole process of, of adulthood, of recognizing, like, how am I going to deal with this history that I have and also deal with the new problems that are going to come up that I'm actually not shielded from just because I'm attending an elite university. Yeah. You're finding your way through Harvard, become a varsity athlete, get a huge job offer with Google, you fall in love, you marry, and yet, meanwhile, the, the traumas, as you've already indicated, they, they continue to haunt you. And so what, what's this process like, beginning to face your story or to re-narrate it in a way in which you are looking, it seems to me, for a more true way to understand your reality than you had to that point. In the years after I graduated college, I really believed that what I was experiencing was just the human condition, that it was normal to never be able to relax, to not be able to spend 15 minutes extra in bed in the morning without having things come back to haunt you. I swung from one extreme of thinking, okay, everything that's happening in my life is a sign of mental illness to thinking, you know, all of this is normal. Even as I had to do more and more to keep my past at bay. I joined the rowing team while I was at Harvard, which was an incredible experience. And also in a way became another form of self-harm where I was working out so, so much that I got very injured. And even after I graduated and there was no more competition, I started working out two, three hours a day because that was really the only way that I knew to discharge this feeling that came over my body of like heat and shame. And I just had to go run for miles and miles and lift weights and do spinning classes to try to get that feeling to dissipate 
even for a little while, so that I could feel any type of peace. It was really when I was 25 and I was getting ready to get married and I had to file a HR report against somebody at work for harassment. It was really that perfect storm that made me realize I really need some help. I do not think that what I'm experiencing is what every other person around me is experiencing. And I think I have post-traumatic stress disorder, which might have been obvious to other people that you go through some of this stuff and then you get PTSD. But, you know, I wasn't eager to put a label on myself. And I did end up in therapy, first some really bad therapy, and then eventually some really good therapy that was very helpful to me. What I found is that I had these horrible memories, right, that manifest in nightmares and flashbacks and physical symptoms. But I also had this overwhelming sense that I should be okay, that I had made it out, I was living the American dream, and therefore I should be happy every day of my life and eternally grateful. Because I knew that I was really lucky and I was so aware of all of the people who had been in similar situations who had not made it out and who were still struggling who perhaps had lost their lives. And it made me feel so ungrateful, so unworthy. And I really think that it was this, this expectation going back to high school and to the college admissions process, this narrative that's so important to us as Americans of being able to turn any tragedy into triumph. And that's what we can do. And that's what we should do and that we're morally obligated to do it. And so when I was still suffering from the impact of these things, it made me feel like the world would be a better place without me because I was so bad that I couldn't just be even happier that I had gone through all of this. We're going to take a short break, but coming right up, Emmy explores the tension between accepting the things that cannot be changed and yet not leaving injustice unchallenged in the present. Hey there, did you know that we have a newsletter? Just imagine if you could have one of your favorite ethics professors send you a list of things to reflect on, think about, practical actions with which to experiment, all on your way to sorting through what it might mean to live a good life. Well, that is the NSC Notebook. I riff on themes and topics related to the show and our guests. Sign up for my NSC Notebook today at nosmallendeavor.com slash newsletter. That's a good place to segue back into this conversation we began earlier about acceptance. And you have a number of hooks, I think, that kind of all in my mind, the conversations relate around the notions of agency, the notion of victimhood, the notion of grit, the notion of acceptance. There's something about the way those things get discussed that you found deeply distressing and or unhelpful to you. And on the other hand, as I read your memoir, it seemed to me that you're pointing us toward the need that we have to someone to bear witness to the profound sorrow and pain that someone has experienced for which one is not responsible. And to just hear someone say, you're not to blame for that. And this is grievous that you had to bear that pain. Is that right? That these kinds of different approaches you're kind of putting in a juxtaposition or tension with one another throughout the book? As you mentioned, I wrote a lot about resilience and about this twisted idea that we have of resilience, where you should just be able to put up with anything and quote unquote, accept whatever life throws your way and do so without complaining, without putting up a fuss, just take it. 
And this isn't just an expectation that I felt. This is something that so many people have since told me that they have experienced. And particularly the more marginalized you are, the more that you are told that your pain does not matter and that you should just suffer in silence. But I think that this idea of acceptance where I had been told, you know, don't try to change your life, just put up with it, that idea I think is a bad one in many cases. But I did rethink this idea of acceptance as I was coming into my young adulthood and as I was writing the book where it really seemed like we have this idealized version of trauma where you come through it and you're so much stronger, blah, blah, blah. But I think that there's real power in recognizing, hey, these experiences changed me and I accept those changes. I am a different person because of what happened to me and that's okay. And I think every single person walking on this planet, we're all shaped by our lives and there can be incredible power in owning that and also in recognizing that in other people and saying, you are still okay. And for me, it was really only when I let go of that expectation that I should be perfect and be so strong all the time that I was able to, to really find what felt like authentic happiness I had to have that grief and that sorrow recognize it and have other people recognize it and validate it in order to be like, that is all true. And I have a wonderful partner. I have a wonderful job. I have a wonderful life and meet my life on its own terms. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. As I processed your storytelling, I thought of a season of my own in therapy where I was sobbing, I was cursing. It was a very profound moment because I, what happened was that as I wrote the therapist a letter later, I said, I said, I think what happened to me in that process was that I realized that there were some adults who should have known better, who either didn't know better or couldn't do better and they should have, but they didn't. And so, so this, this sort of notion of acknowledging the irreversibility of true trauma or pain that does indeed shape us and affect us. And then at the same time, at some point, I needed people to push me not to deny what I had experienced, but to then say, okay, you still do have agency and now you can make some choices. And so I, I think that's what you're also pointing to. It's like, there is this sort of thing of acceptance but there's other stuff that has to be said too, right? There needs to be adults who say what's happening to this child is not acceptable and it needs to be changed. But I don't know, respond to any of that or push back or whatever you might want to say about any of that. That reminds me so much of a James Baldwin quote that I encountered in high school. And over the years, I would always think about the first part of this quote, which goes, you know, I'm going to paraphrase it. you have to hold these two truths in your head at once. The first is the acceptance of the world as it is and men as they are, totally and without rancor. That was like an ideal that I had in my head. You know, I would go through that first part of the quote again and again, and I knew that there was a second part, but I kind of forgot what it was. And it was only as I was finishing up acceptance that I went back and I looked up this quote from Notes from a Native Son, the second part of the quote was, the second thing you have to hold in your head is that we should fight against injustice with all of our might and never ever accept the injustice that's in the world. And that you have to do both and that it's really hard that it tries to split you in half, but I think he really summed it up. And I think it is so useful like as a person to like set aside all those things that you have finite control over. And I don't think we do ourselves any favors when we act like our own individual choices are the only things in the world that matter.
I think we have to have that compassion for each other and for ourselves to recognize that there are bigger problems in the world that are worthy of our attention and our care and that we should be fighting against personally and collectively. Thank you for that. Did you indicate that you were preparing for a child? I am. I'm 38 and a half weeks pregnant, actually. Oh, wow. Congratulations. How do you frame this new season of life that you're coming into out of out of things that you've learned? And what excites you about this new season of life and what perhaps fills you with fear and trembling? Oh, man. What a great question. I think I'm excited to hopefully give my child a totally different family experience than I had. And I have just the most wonderful partner who comes up in the book and really just is the love of my life. And I really am excited to to bring someone into the world who gets to experience that and hopefully who gets enough like love that it makes them want to make the world a better place. And I'm also really nervous about parents will always mess up their kids. <laughs> yeah. In the last number of pages of the book, you tell a story about reconnecting as you're kind of piecing together all this narrative. You reconnect with a, a young man that was kind to you at a traumatic moment at an embassy in Europe, and you reach out to him, and in time he responds. And he said that in spite of all the horror that he had seen that you'd gone through and what, what you had experienced, that thought that you would find a way to, to salvage your life, I think was the word salvage. And you, in this very nicely nuanced way, you, you distinguish between a life that is salvaged versus one that is simply redeemed in the sense of that all of this horrible stuff is in a simplistic way redeemed and everything's okay because you get to a good end. You got to go to Harvard and you got a good job at Google and you, you got married. And instead, you want to hold on to this notion that, no, these painful things are indeed truly painful and they're truly grievous and they shake us and they change us and they they wound us and we then carry those wounds with us. And then you close with these two beautiful paragraphs, I think. And I, would you be willing to share those with us? Yes. Instead of making a life that would redeem the past an impossible feat. I sought out a life that I could live with. For the first time, I felt lucky for the little things. To wake up in the morning in my own bed, to eat breakfast, to do my work. It was no longer so important to me to achieve something great because I was happy to be alive, which had seemed impossible and tenuous. I became grateful for the passing of time each milestone that brings me away from then into now. My marriage, buying an apartment, changing jobs, each new stuffed animal, one day a child of our own, for whom I swear I will not make the same mistakes, though I know I'll fall short in some regard. On my wall, I have a poster that always reminds me of when I was growing up. A girl stares out the window at a city while a plane crosses in front of the moon. Every time I see it, I say a prayer of gratitude to my younger self for delivering me here into adulthood, where I can make my own peace with what I learned along the way. I've been talking to Amy Neatfeld on her beautiful new memoir entitled Acceptance. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much, Lee. You've been listening to No Small Endeavor and our interview with Emmy Neatfeld, author of the wonderful memoir, Acceptance. We gratefully acknowledge the support of Lilly Endowment Incorporated, a private philanthropic foundation supporting the causes of community development, education, and religion. And the support of the John Templeton Foundation, whose vision is to become a global catalyst for discoveries that contribute to human flourishing. Our thanks to all the Stellar team that makes this show possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Sophie Byard, Tom Anderson, Kate Hayes, 
Mary Evelyn Brown, Carriet Harmon, Jason Cheesley, Ellis Osborne, and Tim Lauer. Thanks for listening, and let's keep exploring what it means to live a good life together. No Small Endeavor is a production of PRX, Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studios. Oh.